love is of God. If you love, you're born of Him. Love washed away the multitude of sin. You can uh, take your Bibles tonight if you like. If not, you can just listen. Go to Matthew chapter 12. From the time of Hippocrates to that of Louis Pasteur, the medical profession has relied on plausible but almost wholly mistaken ideas about the causes and the treatments for infectious illness. Bleeding, purging, mysterious remedies remained staple cures and surgeons often wearing filthy butcher aprons carelessly spread infection from patient to patient. Between 1879 and 1900 came what was called the germ revolution. After two decades of scientific expertise, outstanding feats of intellectual courage, bitter personal rivalries, and a large dose of good fortune, doctors came to realize that infectious diseases are caused by microscopic organs. The discovery of the germ led to safe surgery, large-scale vaccination programs, dramatic improvements in hygiene and sanitation, and the pasteurization of dairy products. Above all, it set the stage for the emergence of antibiotic medicine. In years past, doctors did many things. Among their jobs, doctors also delivered babies. As they were waiting around for the mommy to go into labor, the doctors used to spend their time in the morgue in the basement of the hospital and they would experiment on cadavers. At one time in, in history, the death rate of mothers from what they called childbirth um, fever was up to 80%. It wasn't until the mid-1800s that a Hungarian doctor named Ignax Semmelweis made the connection between perpetual fever or childbirth fever and doctor. Semmelweis made the discovery that when the doctors performed autopsies, that they, then they went and delivered babies without washing their hands or changing their clothes, women would develop a perpetual fever and die. Came to the conclusion that the doctors were transferring parts of the autopsy corpses to mothers, which went on to cause the infection. Despite implementing sanitation rules for washing hands and instruments, as well as decreasing the death rate dr dramatically, Semmelweis was not applauded for his discovery. Doctors were offended by the accusation that they were responsible for causing disease, and they continued to practice as always. They just ignored the guy. Death due to perpetual fever... <laughs> The average rates were 25% at the low end, but at the time of the epidemic proportions, it claimed up between 80 to 100% of women birthing in maternal hospitals. That's why the big push for the midwife came in. Because when they studied the midwife's deliveries against the doctor's deliveries, the midwives had almost no perpetual fever because the midwife's were clean, they were sterile, they weren't down somewhere playing with a dead body. That church is a perfect example of spiritual warfare. For the most part, the professing Christian church does not acknowledge the present day reality of spiritual warfare. And as long as the devil can conceal himself, he can continue to operate 
and wreak havoc in the church. And sadly enough to say, by many of the ministers in the church, just like the doctors who took an oath to do good and to protect and preserve life, but unknowingly they were destroying life. Likewise today, many ministers who started out with a good heart, with good intentions, who took an oath to serve God, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, have compromised from that oath. And instead of doing good, they're doing harm. And one of the main reasons they're doing harm is because they don't understand the reality of the spirit realm. In Matthew chapter 12, in verse 26, the Bible says, And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Jesus Christ speaking here. Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto what? You. See? How many kingdoms do you see in those verses? There's two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of the devil, and there's the kingdom of God. Now you know as far back as Genesis, chapter 3, that the snake entered the garden, and he is the arch enemy of God, the arch enemy of all that are called of God, and there has been this war going on ever since the garden. Two kingdoms in conflict, two kingdoms in war. The God of the one kingdom is the devil. The true God is the God of the other kingdom. And there's been a fight ever since. But the church does not recognize the fight. The devil, for the most part, was able to cloak himself in the Old Testament. There were some who understood his workings, but for the most part, he remained cloaked. One of the reasons, according to the scriptures, that the Son of God came was to expose the works of the devil. And his works affect your life. And his works and his word are in the Christian church today, it's sad to say. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, the Bible says, He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Okay. Doesn't say that he's going to sit down at Panera's and have lunch and discuss things so you can work this out peaceably. It says that he might destroy, destroy the works of the devil. Why is the professing Christian church trying to protect and rebuild the works of of the devil in the minds and lives of the congregation of God's people? That's my question. I would venture to say that anyone engaged in this type of campaign puts themselves at odds with the Father, God, and His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now according to the Presbyterian panel survey, 45% of the Presbyterian Church in the United States, and this has to be updated because the survey's two, three years old, and it only gets worse. But at the time of this survey, 45% of the pastors, these are the men and the women who stand behind the lectern, these are the men and women on the pulpit responsible and commissioned to teach the Bible. 
45% of those men and women, and it's more today, strongly disagree or just out and out disagree that only followers of Jesus Christ can be saved. Okay? So, they are promoting what the Bible calls another gospel. You can read about that in Galatians chapter 1. And the scripture says that any man that promotes another gospel is accursed. And they are God's words, not mine. How can you represent God? How can you represent the Lord Jesus Christ? And after all that he did, after all God's planning, after all the ages that he waited for a wonderful woman to believe and have the Messiah, and then once the Messiah was born, looking at his life and all the miraculous love and miracles that he did, only to be taken and beat and tortured like no one else in the world was, how can you as a minister turn your back on that and say, there's another way to heaven. The Buddha's okay. The Muslims are okay. There's more ways to heaven than just Christianity. When the Bible says, Jesus is the only way. Okay? And that's what I'm talking about. Doctors with filthy garments, standing behind pulpits, infecting congregations. And that's not a pretty sight, but spiritual death is the result. In the other case, it was physical death, but in this case, it's spiritual death. Because if you don't teach people about Jesus Christ, and that He's the only way, and that He needs to be confessed, He needs to be your Lord, you need to believe in the resurrection, you need to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. If you don't teach them that, they're not going to get saved. They're not going to get born again. It takes more than just living a good life. It takes more than just works. Okay? And this mainstream Christian denomination, the leaders of it, don't even believe it, or they strongly disagree with it. That's a sin. 60% of born-again Christians don't believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven, and this is backdated. It needs to be updated when this poll was taken. According to a survey commissioned by Probe Ministries, we're talking about Christians now. We're not just talking about Joe from the block. We're talking about Christians. 60% of Christians don't believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. How is this possible in the church? Do you want me to tell you how it's possible? Number one, people don't read their Bibles. They don't read the Bibles for themselves. And when you don't read your Bible for yourself, and when you don't have the knowledge of God's Word, God says in His Word that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The Hosea 4. In Hosea 4, verse 6, that's exactly what it says. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But talking to the minister now, the priest, the one responsible to teach that knowledge, because thou has rejected knowledge. They've rejected knowledge. Today in every church, with all the garbage that's been going on in the world, and like I told you a thousand times, the world can have all the garbage they want, but it's got to stay on that side of the door when it comes to the church. The church is to be a haven. The church is to be a place where you can be blessed, where you can have pure doctrine, where you can get your needs met, where you can rejoice, where you can pray, where you can be safe. The church is the one place where the President of the United States and the gas attendant are even. There's no partiality in the church. You see? No one is looked at for their title. No one is respected more for their title. And if they are, there's something wrong. Okay? You never brag about your accomplishments. You never live off of your past accomplishments, and you never live off of your past failures. 
the Bible says the greatest in the church is the greatest servant. That's not the way the world works. The greater you are in the world, the more servants you have. You have a limousine, you have a driver, you have a helicopter, you have an airplane, you have houses, plural, one for winter, one for spring, one for fall, one for summer, all of these things. And you're served. But Jesus Christ said the Son of Man came not to, serve, to be served, but to serve. And any minister has to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And that means that your job as a minister is to serve. Not to brag, not to be served, not to expect people to take care of you. If God works in people's hearts, that's the way that works. But that's between you and God. No minister has a right to demand that of you. Any minister that demands that of you or tries to manipulate that out of you does not have a personal relationship with God because he does not believe that the Father can take care of him. So he's going to take care of himself. Don't you know we can do a better job, right? No, you can't. You're silly. You can't do a better job. Learn to trust God. Learn to believe that God will meet your needs. Learn to believe that God does love you as much as He says He loves you in His Word and He will take good care of you if you would just let Him. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou has rejected knowledge. And the only thing God had left to do was, I will also reject thee and you will be no priest to me. And I'm telling you today... I don't care how many hundreds of thousands are in the denomination or tens of thousands are in the mega church. If those people are not preaching the word of God, God is rejecting them. And you will stand sterling on the platform, head and shoulders above them at the Bema. And if they're born again by the grace of God, they're in because of the life of Jesus Christ. We're in for the, because of the life of Jesus Christ too. But we are to be born again. We are to be saved unto working for God. Helping people. Blessing people. It's not about what I can get. It's not about what you can give me. It's not what, what I want to overlord. I don't want to overlord over anything. I got a problem enough overlording over me. I don't want to overlord over you. God's, that's above my pay grade. But it's not above God's. And he has given us his wonderful matchless word to teach us how we act. To teach us how to respond. To teach us how we should be towards one another. How we should love one another. How we should respect one another. How we should stick together and protect one another. If you had a brother and a sister growing up, if some bully came and said something bad about your brother or your mommy or your daddy, what did you do? Did you go have lunch with them? No, you stuck up for your brother and your sister. Right? That's what you do in the, in, the, in the family. That's what you do in the church. Look at 2 Corinthians, please. People are not aware of the reality of the devil. Many churches just dismiss him. Now, you got the other end of the coin, too, where if you look at someone the wrong way, that's a devil spirit. You cannot go that route. You have to be tempered with the Word of God. Not everything in life is a devil spirit. Okay? It's not. You are an imperfect person living in an imperfect world using imperfect tools and sometimes it just happens. Okay? If you get a flat tire, a devil spirit didn't put a nail in your tire. Maybe you just shouldn't go that way to work next time. It happens. Okay? It's, you know what a city of refuge is in the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. If you did something by accident mm -hmm. and you fled to the city of refuge, you know what you had? You had the judges there. And you were safe there. And if it was an accident, you know what you were pronounced? It was an accident. You didn't do this on purpose. Accidents happen. Now, if you have an accident four times a day, I'd be looking for a cause, <laughs> right? Yeah, but stuff happens. 
In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3, it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them who are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The only thing that separates Christianity from all the other religions out there is Jesus Christ and the resurrection. Jesus Christ is the only person that God raised from the dead that is still up. Muhammad is dead, and that's where he's at. Buddha is dead, that's where he's at. All the great prophets, all the great leaders of all other religions are dead. Are dead. The only one that God authenticated was his son on the third day and raised him up. And he was seen of more than 500 brethren. And then he gave the gift of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. That's what separates Christianity from the rest of the religions in the world. Did I say the people in the other religions were bad? No. What I did say is that you don't get to heaven unless you have Jesus Christ. And if you cannot stand behind a pulpit and say that, you don't belong behind a pulpit. You want a social church, you want to go bowling, and you want to sing Kumbaya, that's fine. But it's not a Christian church. And you are doing a disservice to God. You are doing, listen, after all he went through, after all the mocking, they spit on him, they beat him, they whipped him, he bled, he cried, he hurt, they humiliated him. After all he went through, you have the nerve to stand up and say, eh, you can get to heaven without that. If you could have got to heaven without it, why did God send him in the first place? You think God enjoyed watching his son be tortured? Do you enjoy watching your child be tortured? Some of you can't stand a cat that gets tortured. You go out of your minds. Or a dog. What do you think God felt like when he saw his kid on the cross? But he had to do it. And then, people who are supposed to represent his kid, people who are supposed to represent the Word of God, say, well, yeah, I know he did that, but there's another way. No other way. There is no other way. There's one way. If that upsets you, I'm sorry. Be upset. But I'm not changing what I'm going to teach till I die. That's the truth of God's Word. Because I love you. Because I will give you the way to eternal life. And one day you'll say, thank you. See? In whom the God of this world, verse 4, has blinded the minds that those that believe not. He's the God of this world. Okay. So he's the God of this world. That means what he wants, his narrative, he puts out into the world as the God of this world. Do you know how he puts his narrative his catechism, his word into the world through the media and his ministers that work for the media. That's how he gets it out. That's how he changes the worldview of people from Christians who should have a biblical worldview to quote-unquote so-called Christians who have a worldly worldview. Okay? And a worldly worldview is anything that contradicts the Word of God. The two cannot occupy the same space. And they got all of this junk, and we got teachers in here, we got all this garbage, this critical race garbage theory crap that is designed to unearth this country and flip things around. I taught you. There's only one race according to the Bible, and that's called the human race. Okay? All this other junk that these PhDs think up in their minds, it's a lie from the pit of hell. And it's sown into the world to cause division and hatred. So they can introduce the answer to the problem that they have created. But they say it's our problem. It's not our problem. We've been lied to. 
It's their problem. They want to create the problem so they can introduce the answer to the problem. The man's been doing that ever since he's been breathing. He's always got a better way. He always knows better than God. Let's throw the Bible away. That's an old book. We got a better way. We're going to figure it out. Did you ever hear the poem about the anvil of God's word? Where the man walked by a blacksmith and he looked on the floor and there was 12, 15 hammers just destroyed laying on the floor. And he talked to the blacksmith and he said, Sir, he said, how many anvils have you had to destroy the hammers? And he just said, one. Just one. And that's what God's word is like. They keep hitting God's word. They keep trying to destroy God's word. And you know what happens when you try to destroy something that is God's? You don't win. Okay? You lay on the floor like a thrown discarded hammer, dull, useless, and you get an, and you know, they get another one though because they got a new and improved model. They got the 12.0 version. Which iPhone up to now? 12? 13? Okay. Oh, yeah. you're in the past, Liz. You're a dinosaur. They, yeah, the flip phone. They got the new improved, and they're, and they're coming back, and they got new ideas. And you know what? The Bible says, seek ye the old way, where it is the good way. That's what it is. But men will be men. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. It says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of who? The devil. The devil oppresses people. That doesn't mean that every time a person is oppressed, it's the devil. What it means is that the devil is the author of oppression. And sometimes, in certain cases, he's there oppressing a person. Ephesians 6, verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. The power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You know what Paul learned in 2 Corinthians 12, chapter 12, verse 10? This is what he said. He said, for when I am weak, then I am what? Strong. And that's something the church needs to learn. Because if you're going to fight the adversary of your own ability, you're a loser. Let me say it another word. If you think you're real smart, and you got it all figured out, and you're going to go to battle with the adversary, he's going to hand your butt back to you. The Bible says when you're weak... You're what? Strong. You're strong. Because you rely on God. You understand? And He can energize you. And He can give you that which you need to accomplish His will. And that keeps you humble. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about our Father. It's about Jesus Christ. And you have to stay faithful. And one of the ways you stay faithful is you stay together. Iron sharpeneth iron. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, the Bible says. You can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. Do you understand? If you could do it alone, then the life of Jesus Christ was wasted. He gave us a body to function in, to help, to love. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the methods, the schemes of the devil. He schemes how he can disrupt you. And he will disrupt you any way he can because he knows what buttons to push with you. He knows your button. He knows my button. Okay? And he pushes them. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. In high places. You ever walk out into the ocean? For the most part, 
some people don't like to get their face wet. I'm not going to mention any names. <laughs> and if they go underwater, you know what they do? They do this kind of thing. Watch. Oh, no. Watch. <laughs> and if they can have a bathing cap on, all the better. <laughs> now, if you do that in the ocean, okay, that's okay. You get to see the sun. You get to see the horizon. You might see some dolphins. You might see a shark. Then you want to get out of the ocean, right? You might see some boats. See the other swimmers. See the pretty colors. What kind of polka dot what bikini was that? Itsy bitsy teeny weeny. Yellow, 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 yellow polka dot yellow. bikini. You might see a yellow polka dot bikini. Right? You might see a lot of things. That's Christians, right? If a lot of Christians are like that, and that's okay. But you know what? A whole nother world exists if you go underwater. Mm -hmm. That you could live your life and never experience as a Christian. That's what the spirit realm's like. Mm -hmm. You go underwater, you know what you see? Clams, lobsters, crabs, fish, colors, coral reefs, sand, all kinds of stuff, right? It was always there. It was always there. But you know what? You never saw it. You know why? Because you stayed above the surface. And the reason why people stay above the surface is because the, those responsible over them don't have the knowledge to instruct them into the realm of the deep. The deep things of God's Word. And when you stay above the surface, that's how you'll live at your Christian life. And I'm not saying that is bad. What I'm saying is that there's more to God than just the clouds and the birds. What are them kind of birds that steal your food? Seagull. Yeah. Seagull. Seagull will steal your food. Trust me. Had a donut once he tried to get <laughs> Didn't end well for the seagull. <laughs> Second Corinthians 10. I lived my life many years above the surface. And I was blessed, and I read about this, and I read about that. But you know what? I never saw a clam until I went underwater. And then once you go underwater and you see all that activity, you say to yourself, how in the world did I ever miss it? You know how? The devil doesn't want you to see it. He wants to cloak himself. He wants to remain invisible to you. Because if he's invisible to you, he can go about doing what he wants to do and you will never expect it. You will never even consider the possibility that something's wrong here. I'm not one that fighteth and beateth the air. That's what Paul says. You know what that means? You don't know what you're you don't know what you're fighting. You don't know what you're punching at. You're just throwing punches and you're missing. You got to know your enemy. You got to know how to defeat your enemy. You cannot defeat your enemy in and of yourself. But Jesus Christ did and can, and will never leave you helpless or hopeless. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not cardinal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. There's two ways to walk there. We're going to read it in Romans where we're going to close chapter 8. It says we walk in the flesh. Yes, we live here and we walk upon this earth in this space suit, which is our body, in the flesh. And everything that we have learned to do, listen to me, everything that we have learned to do since you drew your first breath was, was in the flesh. That's your default mode. All right? That's why you have to redo your mind. Because your default mode is the flesh. 
the flesh was there to bring you to the point where you could understand the Word of God. And then, once you understood the Word of God, you received Jesus Christ, God wants you to know that now there's a different world and a different way to walk. The temptation is going to go to your default mode. But you have to change your mind, renew your mind, and you're not going to do either unless you know what's available, and you're not going to know what's available unless you read the Bible. You can't trust me when I tell you what's available. If I read it to you out of the Word of God, you can trust God. I'm just simply showing it to you. You're not trusting me, you're trusting what you see. You understand? And then you've got to read for yourself. I often, I, thought, this, I saw, thought about this today. Everything for me from the beginning was hard. It was hard. They took my money. They got me deprogrammed. They threw me out. I lived in a garage. I didn't, you know, it was just hard. It was hard. It was hard. And I had to learn how to do the word myself. Because if I didn't learn how to do the word myself, I was going to sink. Nobody came to my rescue. I had to do for myself and do and do and do. But what I didn't realize is that all of those times that it was hard and I overcame and I did and I studied and I learned and I did more and I did more and I did more. I was building a foundation of God's word in my life. And then I thought about people who had the word handed to them on a silver platter. Didn't have to work for it. Didn't have to stress or fight or anything for it. And they didn't respect it. You know why they didn't respect it? Because they didn't work for it. I started out in a two-car garage for $25 a month was the rent. And I used to go to the bathroom in a bucket. And I had an extension cord from the house that I rented the guy from. And that's a true story. But I persevered, and I persevered, and I persevered, and I stayed faithful. And I did the same with the Word of God. And then when the wind came and the storms came, my house was built on a rock. I realized that. You know why? Because I always had to do for myself. I always had to prepare for myself. I always, and I went here and I did this and I did such. And, but I always never replaced, never replaced that which I did at home. And it can't replace it for you. If you are not studying, if you are not reading, if you are not praying if for yourself, you're missing it. You can't live off of my believing or the person sitting next to you. You may, but it's not going to last very long because that person isn't going to be around when the crap hits the fan. Oh, but God will. And you have to know that God will care. And you have to know that you have to stay faithful and stay put and endure for you have need of patience after you have done the will of God that you may receive the what? promise. And patience doesn't come easy because while you're sitting there being patient, patiently enduring, the devil's yanking on your arm. He's throwing rocks at you. He's throwing eggs at you. Why? Because that's what he does. That's what he does. But God is faithful. If you get anything tonight, get this. God is faithful. He will take care of you. He can take care of you. He's faithful. He's been faithful throughout the years with people worse than us. He was faithful to them stunads in Israel. Walking them around 40 years in the desert, feeding them with manna. He was still faithful. But they weren't. We close at Romans 8, verse 5. The Bible says that we walk in the flesh... But we don't war after the flesh. You can't approach a spiritual situation with a sense of solution. It doesn't work. Okay? And that's what they're doing in the church. Do you understand? They're approaching spiritual things. Things that God said. Abortion. They're killing kids. Murder is a, is a sin. Homosexual. Marriage. That's a sin. Adultery. That's a sin. Listen, listen to me. You're going to think I'm nuts. Pretty soon, pretty soon, that's what's going to be coming. And there's already a segment of the country and already a segment of people who are having more than 
an open marriage, they're called, I guess. Do whatever you want. Because you know why? Because they don't respect the sanctity of God's word and what God says about a subject. And that's what they're going to do. It won't end with just man and woman and man and man and woman. It won't end there. It'll end with a free society that can do whatever they want to do and put themselves on the computer like a piece of meat and push a button and say, okay, I'll hook up with you tonight. That's where it's gone. That's where it always goes when you ignore God. For they that are after the flesh, verse 5, do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. You have a choice. Okay? Your default is the flesh, but you have a choice. You understand? You're either going to walk by the spirit, or you're going to walk by the flesh. Make up your mind. For to be cardinally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the cardinal mind is enmity against God. When you hear of all these things going on in the world, and how they are very abrasive, and how they are aggressive, and they're just disgraceful, and they disrespect God, the reason why that is, is because that's coming from the cardinal mind. Because that is an enemy of God. It's enmity against God. What, what do you expect? That's, what, that's all that they can do. That's why they need the word. You were like that one time. You may not have been as brash and bold and brazen, but you were like that one time. So was I. Because it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. They're funding abortion. More money, more money, more money. They can't be subject to the law of God. Everybody talks about the Holocaust. The American Holocaust is way worse than what happened over in Germany. There are more children killed here than whatever happened over there. And you know what we do? My body, my right. We, we come up with little catchphrases. And that's supposed to make it all better. But I wonder if that person would have said that if they were in the situation where they were going to be aborted. I bet you they were happy their mommy had them. But it's real easy to say it about somebody else. So they that are in the flesh, what? You can't please God. Cannot please God. Verse 8. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. The churches that are promoting CRT, the churches that are promoting the homosexual movement, the churches that are doing all of these goofy, silly things that aren't on the Word of God, they're walking by the flesh. And you want to know something? They are not pleasing God. Your heart and my heart should be that we want to please our Father and love our Father. Does that mean that you got to go around with a, the Word of God like a six-shooter on your hip and start shooting people? That No. Because then you're, you're messed up. That means you love people. You talk to them. You have a spirited conversation with them. And you give them the truth. And if they want to listen, or if they want to listen again, they'll come back. But unless you open your mouth and you love them, they're never going to know. You can't condemn them. You can't wave your hand. You can't say they're bad. They're this. No. Because the guy that goes out and cheats on his wife is just as bad as the homosexual. Which is just as bad as the person who's killing babies. And they took an oath to protect and preserve life. Now, if that's not an oxymoron, I don't know what is. It's a Hippocratic oath, right? You're a doctor. I'll be right back. I have to go kill a couple kids. See how ridiculous it is? They're, they're, they're hypocrites. They're hypocrites. They swore to protect, and they're destroying. And nobody says a word. But we're not like that. We want to please our Father, and we want to be the kind of men and women that God's called us to be. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thanks for your word. It's not everybody else in the world is bad, Father. That's not what it's about. What it's about is that you're number one, and we have to hold the line on your word. 
We're loving and we're kind, but we don't budge when it comes to your word. And it's your word that gives life. It's your word that gives resurrection. It's your word that gives salvation. And nobody can touch that word, Father. And may we keep it pure and present that word and love people and encourage them to do that word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Don't forget to click that like button and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And remember, if we are shut down for some type of censorship reason, you can always check out our videos at www.cvm.church. Thank you for your patronage. This was brought to you by Chapter and Verse Ministry. Love is a God If you love, you're born of Him Love washed away The multitude of sin